Coming up on today's edition of Airborne, Spaceship Two flies under power for the first time. Congress folds and the FAA furloughs are canceled. And with approved changes, the Dreamliner is cleared to fly again. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Dale. After a number of unpowered test flights, in which Spaceship Two was dropped from beneath its White Knight Two mothership to evaluate its flying qualities, Spaceship Two has finally had the chance to fly under power. The vehicle utilizes a rubber-based solid fuel and nitrous oxide to power its single-engine propulsion system. An early Monday morning test flight titleized a short 16-second burn that allowed the crew to evaluate the vehicle's performance and handling under power, while also exceeding Mach in the process. The much-delayed program is designed to be the first to carry commercial passengers into non-orbital space flights, and it will cost its tourist astronauts about $200,000 apiece. The flight test was conducted out of Scale Composites Mojave California Flight Center where the program has been gearing up for commercial service since it won the X Prize in 2004. Commercial operations will be carried out in New Mexico at a dedicated facility in Las Cruces. In the wake of growing consumer anger over airline flight delays, Congress worked quickly last week to pass legislation that would provide the FAA with funding to eliminate air traffic controller furloughs. First, the Senate and then the House passed a bill that would provide the FAA the authority to utilize unspent airport improvement program funds and additional flexibility to transfer other funding within the FAA, up to $253 million, in order to prevent reduced operations and staffing during fiscal year 2013. President Obama had earlier promised to sign the law if it was passed. On Sunday, April 21st, the FAA began furloughs of 47,000 employees due to the sequester that have led to significant flight delays across the aviation system. A report on UTSanDiego.com says the FAA and DOT did not respond to repeated questions about when the controller's furloughs would end. According to a report, a spokesman for Senator Susan Collins, who helped write the bill, said Friday that DOT Secretary Ray LaHood would say only that the agency is, quote, doing everything they can to get things back on track as quickly as possible, end quote. The FAA on Thursday said that as soon as U.S. airlines make the necessary changes to the Dreamliner's battery system, it is clear to return to revenue service. Tom Patton reports. The approval was released as an airworthiness directive by the FAA with an effective date of April 26th. The AD requires installing main and auxiliary power unit or APU battery enclosures and environmental control system ducts and replacing the main battery, APU battery, and their respective battery chargers. While the AD applies to all U.S. registered airplanes, only United has actually taken delivery of a 787. That carrier has six of the airplanes that will need to be repaired at a cost of about $2.8 million each. In Japan, where some officials had said that the certification process might take longer, civil aviation authorities said that they would follow the FAA's lead in approving a return of the airplanes to service as soon as they had been modified. All Nippon Airways conducted the first flight test of one of its Dreamliners on Sunday. Boeing has delivered 50 Dreamliners to airlines worldwide. All have been grounded since the battery incidents in January, and several carriers have said that they will seek restitution from the plane maker for lost revenue while the battery system was revamped. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Twelve years after the fact, and with the event of recent days in Boston still on everyone's mind, a piece of one of the 9-11 aircraft has been found in New York City. Construction survey crews found a piece of one of the landing gear for one of the aircraft used to take down the Twin Towers, jammed between two buildings about a quarter mile away from Ground Zero. ABC News reports that the discovery was made Friday, just days after human remains had been found at the Ground Zero site. The aircraft debris carried both a Boeing stamp and a serial number that confirmed it came from one of the terrorist-controlled aircraft. Boeing has since confirmed that the wreckage does in fact come off of a Boeing jetliner. 
The discovery site was cordoned off as a crime scene, while officials decided whether to search for human remains in the area. More than 40 percent of the New York victims of 9-11 still have not been formally identified. As part of its 65th anniversary celebration, Technium on Thursday made its worldwide premiere reveal of the Technium Astor Next Generation Light Sport Aircraft at Aero Friedrichshafen, Germany, 2013. The Technium Astor is an all-new two-seat low-wing aeroplane that the company says offers, quote, superlative performance and value, end quote. Technam says the new airplane combines Italian styling, the latest technological innovations, high standards of comfort, and very low purchase and operating cost. The Technam Astor has been developed by Techman's head of aircraft design, Professor Luigi Pascal. The Technam Astor design includes innovations such as an Apple iPad Mini supplied with each aircraft as standard. The airplane's interior is ergonomically designed allowing for enhanced all-around visibility, control, and switches that can be easily reached. Customers are offered a choice of engines with the Rotax 912 ULS, the 912 IS, and the 914 engine, all available as options. The engines will operate on both MoGas and AvGas. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird X-Wind SE and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulation.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne Aero TV, our website or our podcast, drop us an email to news spy at aero news.net. Like Homing has approved the release of service instruction SI 1070, adding 31 engines to the list of models approved for use on UL 91 unleaded Avgas and bringing the total number approved to 63. With the Lycoming engine model approvals, the EASA Safety Information Bulletin 2011-01 immediately allows ASTM D7547 grade UL91 use on European Union-based aircraft, such as the Cessna 152, the Cessna 172 Skyhawk, and Cessna 182 Skylane the Diamond DA-40 and DA-42 L360, and many others. UL-91 originally entered into distribution in Europe, largely to serve engines and aircraft approved to operate on automotive specification fuels. Michael Kraft, Lycoming Senior Vice President and General Manager, says, quote, This latest revision of SI-1070 represents the final set of currently existing engine models that can operate on UL-91 without any alteration of the engine type design operating limitations. Altering engine type design operating limitations means that aircraft performance would likely be affected. SI-1070S provides consumers and fuel producers alike a view as to which engines have an octane demand that is best satisfied by a UL-100 solution. This is why we remain vigorously supportive of a long-term unleaded 100 low lead replacement fuel and emphasize that unleaded 91 is not a replacement for 100 low lead, but a very robust unleaded aviation suitable alternative to automotive gasoline. Glass Air has issued a service bulletin for all sportsman aircraft. Following the discovery of cracks at the aft base of the vertical fin of a few airplanes. According to the document service bulletin 70, Exterior cracking is most commonly found on the right-hand side where the vertical fin meets the aft fuselage at its base. The left-hand vertical fin is molded as part of the fuselage, whereas the right-hand vertical fin half is bonded to the fuselage and vertical fin as a separate piece during fuselage assembly. The exterior cracks are commonly showing up along the bonding joint. The bulletin requires the following actions. 
An inspection is to be completed prior to the next flight. Repairs to interior cracks and separation are to be completed prior to the next flight. Reinforcement of the attachment of the vertical fin spar to bulkhead C with part number 101-000-1901 should be completed after all composite repairs are accomplished. Installation should be completed prior to or during the next annual inspection. Glass Air says it found that while repairs to the existing structure are important, the reinforcement doubler by far is the most significant component to prevent future cracking issues in this area. Some legal critics call it shotgun litigation. The practice of naming as many defendants as possible when seeking damages after an accident. An accident on April 10, 2011 that fatally injured retired Air Force pilot Edward Lamadou of North Yarmouth, Maine, has resulted in lawsuits being filed against nine companies, with the pilot's children and the owners of a home that was destroyed jointly bringing the action. Lamadou's Cessna 402B went down on approach to Bidford Municipal Airport when it lost power in its right engine at about 500 feet. Lamadou was unable to maintain altitude and impacted the house. According to the filing documents, he was alive and conscious when the plane became engulfed in flames. The NTSB probable cause report says, quote, the pilot did not maintain minimum controllable airspeed while on final approach with a partial loss of power in the right engine which resulted in a loss of control. Contributing to the accident was the partial loss of engine power in the right engine due to the improperly installed O-rings in the engine's throttle and control assembly." End quote. The suit names nine companies as having at least partial responsibility for the accident, including those allegedly that manufactured parts for the aircraft or were involved in the maintenance and inspections. Attorney Lance Walker told the Portland Press Herald that the companies did such things as conduct the annual inspection and otherwise certified the airplane's airworthiness. The homeowner's insurance company is looking to recoup a $500,000 claim on the house. Lamadou's children are seeking an unspecified amount from a jury for the wrongful death of their father. If you're one of those still sitting on the fence about the idea of learning to fly, today's Aero Video of the Week might help. I don't mind. It was surprisingly easy. Modern light planes practically fly themselves. Learning the maneuvers took a little concentration, but it was fun. And there was an unexpected dividend. Up there in the blue, I forgot my problems on the ground. Sales it's a great trip back in time to the 1960s. Simply search YouTube for Wings for Downing Thomas and enjoy this 12-minute time warp. Jane, of course, was taking lessons too. And now NASA is asking, can you hear me now? Three smartphones destined to become low-cost satellites rode to space Sunday aboard the maiden flight of Orbital Science Corporation's Antares rocket from NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility in Virginia. The trio of phone sats is operating in orbit and may prove to be the lowest cost satellite ever flown in space. The goal of NASA's phone sat mission is to determine whether a consumer grade smartphone can be used as the main flight avionics of a capable yet very inexpensive satellite. Transmissions from all three phone sats have been received at multiple ground stations on Earth, indicating they are operating normally. The phone sat team at the Ames Research Center in Moffett Field, California, will continue to monitor the satellites in the coming days. The satellites are expected to remain in orbit for as long as two weeks. Satellites consisting mainly of the smartphones will send information about their health via radio back to Earth in an effort to demonstrate they can work as satellites in space. The spacecraft also will attempt to take pictures of Earth using their cameras. With satellites like these, who knows, maybe someday ET will phone home. 
Well, that's our program. Get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories anytime at aero-news.net. And please remember, Airborne is streamed twice weekly and is always online. Join us again this Friday for another edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.